Hey everyone, this is the Innovators Mindset Podcast with Dr. Katie Novak and Dr. Katlyn Tucker. There we go. Yay! Yay! <laughs> All right. Wow, this is an exciting start. Before, before we get into it, and hey, we are we are so excited because today we are going to talk about the release of your new book, the third in the Godfather trilogy of books. <laughs> Do you remember this? Yeah, I, I don't even like that you're using that comparison since you told us the third movie was it's not never, great. Never, never, <laughs> never, oh, never no. good. <laughs> and it's like so good. We're like going like, we're going like, that, that was the first of three, but there could be more coming up, right? Yeah, so, we're going like Star Wars on this one. <laughs> let's do it. Okay, so shift, shift, Seven. shift writing into the classroom with UDL and blended learning the third godfather uh but mm -hmm. good <laughs> which is very important because the, the second godfather is probably better than the first godfather but the third godfather is no good yeah. no good so before we get into the book um i do can i ask you this question we talked about um clothes renting and uh mm -hmm. This is a little, can we talk about this? Like, I did not know this is a thing. So this is a little, yeah. pop, is it pop culture? Is it would be considered pop culture conversation right now? Before we get in the books, because I think this is- yeah. Trending fashion. I, I learned know. today, yeah. subscription clothes purchasing. Is that yeah. what it is? So who wants to, I want, I want to know about this. Tell me more about this. Okay. Maybe I, I mean, I feel that she turned it on, <laughs> turned me on yeah. to it. I right. feel like if anyone from Rent the Runway is listening, Kat and I are very interested in remodeling your clothes. But here's the thing: um, <laughs> Rent the Runway, clothes. Rent the Runway. <laughs> all right, all right. Rent the Runway is a subscription service where you borrow clothes instead of buying them and then like wearing them one time so like tonight for example i'm going to like a winter wonderland party right. and i needed a blue sequin dress and if i bought a blue sequin dress then i probably would never wear it again but so rent the runway is you go on the app and you pick out the things that you want to wear that week and then it sends them to your house that is the case. and you like have all your outfits you don't have to dry clean them you don't have to wash them you put them back in the bag and then you say, okay, I'm putting them in the mail, send me new things. And it's like a total trust issue. You know, they know trust issues. And then you get your new <laughs> things. So like, mm -hmm. if I'm going skiing, obviously I'm going to rent like an opera, opera all day sweater. If I'm going to like present, I, you know, I might get like a cute little like, you know, business suit. And Kat's sweater right now is actually a rent the runway. So they have like yes. lovely, lovely things. And so mm -hmm, George was horrified that no i wasn't like, horrified i just never heard of this before. i never heard of this oh there was a little bit of judgment maybe like oh, a little a little lacing well, of judgment. no <laughs> i just felt bad because i actually bought my and it's just so you know can i give you let's see if we do a little canadian trivia what is this thing on top of my head called right now i want to know if you know what it's called a beanie nope it's not a beanie i don't beanie first of all a beanie has a propeller <laughs> right so like, uh, if you can, we call them beanie right? in new england yeah so it is a i'm gonna teach you something today it's a hold on cat what do you think it's called oh geez i gave it what away what would you call it i i know i would have said beanie too it's a toque that is a very i'm bringing this now that i live in the united states i am bringing toque. the term it is a toque right a beanie how do you spell that yeah, that is has, how do you, how let's do you talk about that? that today and when we're exploring the new book shift right into classroom <laughs> with udl and blended learning i think it okay i think it is don't quote me on this. I think it's T O Q U E. It could be oh, wow. T O U Q U E. I don't, I can't remember. Oh, now we're all Googling stuff. Okay. No, it is T O Q U E. And it says a toque is a type of hat with a narrow brim or no brim. Right. And a pom pom mm -hmm. and a pom pom. A beanie, like when you think of, like, did, I don't know if this is like a, you know, cartoon thing. Like when kids used to wear beanies in cartoons, they'd have a little propeller on the top. Do you remember that? That's why I would see a beanie. So, no. All right. Well, no, that, that is, is the, not that is the end of the fashion portion. Of oh, the okay, okay. Sponsored by Rent the Runway. <laughs> no, hey, we. I am really. No, it's excited. not sponsored. Not sponsored. Not sponsored. <laughs> not sponsored. Not sponsored. Well, not yet. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe. And let's turn it yeah. over to the promo. Okay. So we. This is actually the third. <laughs> this is the third book. And so 
Um, I remember I was really excited about this. Uh, we have three books here. The first one is UDL and Blended Learning. This was actually published in 2021. And then the next one is The Shift to Student-Led, Reimagining Classroom Workflows with UDL and Blended Learning. Now, these are two of the most prolific writers I've, I've ever met. Both of them, whenever they're not answering a question right now, they're probably writing another book, right? They're taking turns <laughs> like, you talk, I'll write. I'm going to get done the next book. Back. <laughs> so, um, so before we get into the, the third book, I want you to just talk about some of the impact that you've seen because th these both these books have done amazingly well with their communities. I see a lot of conversation about them. Uh, talk about like, talk about some of the impact that you've seen. Uh, become, and I'll, actually, I'll start with uh, Catelyn because, Katie, you really dominated the Rent the Runway conversation. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, right, so let's start I'll, with Catelyn. I'll step back. I'll go back, in, I'll go back <laughs> in the corner here, George. Right, all right. Oh, my goodness. I think for me, <laughs> what's been really interesting is that working with Katie in that first book, UDL and Blended Learning, we obviously really wanted to give teachers – a skill set and a mindset and like understand how these two frameworks can complement each other. And the interesting part for me has been seeing people who were already bought into UDL, mm -hmm. but didn't know as much about blended learning, getting excited about leveraging the models to really try to make putting the core beliefs and principles at the heart of UDL into practice. And then on the flip side, really seeing people who had kind of already started their blended learning journeys or were well into kind of integrating technology in meaningful ways, really starting to think deeply about how to make learning more equitable and inclusive and accessible with blended learning. So really kind of that, the, the power and magic of those two mm -hmm. together and helping people to appreciate it. And that first book was something I loved seeing. But in the second book, I think there's so many concrete strategies for teachers to choose from, to kind of play with, to shift these really time-consuming teacher-led workflows. And I think one of the things that's been fascinating, and I don't know if you've seen this too, Katie, is that there's always this onboarding process, right? These hmm. student-led workflows are awesome, but you have to explain why they're valuable. You have to right. model, you have to guide them through the process. And then I see all these teachers kind of get over that initial onboarding kind of time investment. And they're like, oh, now I get it. I get how magical these shifts can be in terms of freeing me from the front of the room and allowing me to really work with students in small groups or individually. So those are some of the things that I've loved seeing as people have delved into this work and done book studies and played around with kind of what Katie and I are suggesting. And what do you think, Katie? I mean, I was going to say that I think after reading the first book, people go, okay, I love it. I have no time to do it. Right. <laughs> and so I think the the second book was really, really strategic in saying, all right, like this is now that you buy in, this is yeah. how you're going to begin to shift over and lots of different options for the workflows you can start with. But kids are absolutely capable of taking on the responsibility of this work with the right scaffolding, with constant mm -hmm feedback and coaching. I think that sometimes when people learn about universal design for learning, they imagine the space where we're just like, sure, kids do whatever you want. And it's really about what is it that all kids have to know and do? And what are the potential valuable ways, the pathways we can give them to do it? But knowing that in any of these scenarios, it's not just shifting over to student led and then piecing out and getting a coffee. But while students mm -hmm. are doing that, we're no longer in front of the classroom, which gives us a much, much more important job to facilitate, to redirect, to provide feedback. Because the reality is, is that no one makes responsible decisions all the time. And if students are taking ownership what? of no it, one? it doesn't mean it's going to be a perfect, oh, except for you, George. But um, <laughs> you know, no, students are not going to automatically, when we give them responsibility, Mm -hmm. always choose the best thing for their learning. And so this is not a, let me like toss it over to you, but let me shift it so that I'm available to do right. much more important human work so mm -hmm. that we're releasing over time responsibilities. So when they don't have us there, when they go out into their adult lives, they do have the capacity to make solid decisions a lot of the time. You know, th when you, I, I love the concept of, kind of like really explaining why this is really important because if you actually didn't do that and then you show the strategies, then people go, well, why are we doing this? 
Mm-hmm. Right. And like teachers, teachers are notorious for this as I was, right. It's like, I don't understand the big vision. I think that's a huge step that's often missed is that we show really great ideas, but we don't actually talk about, um, you know, why this is essential. What's the long-term vision for this? Why does this really, really matter? So I love this too. So, um, if you could maybe in, um, if anyone just has maybe a whiteboard and they could do like a little Pictionary, <laughs> not, not like a full whiteboard, but just a, <laughs> A mini whiteboard. There's a mini a whiteboard, mini whiteboard. that I- kind of covers part of a TV. <laughs> I actually see it. I, my head is, okay, right. so I'm you, sorry. It's, it's a rotating. <laughs> right. <laughs> sorry, I had to bring it up. I had to bring it up. This is, uh, yeah, this is very. You're just hating on my whiteboard. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. Just, no. I mean, no. and just think, you spend so much time trying to hide the tv and then he called you out but it's it's because you wanted to cover the tv and then you use your head and then you started turning so this is why you watch on youtube everybody because i'm very (laughs) i'm very like active i like gesticulate i move around a lot that's why every photo on x looks like me like screaming at a rally (laughs) tatlin lives the shift she just (laughs) she lives it shifting in her chair just so you know it is all it is all the uh it is all the thought you put behind blocking the tv behind you (laughs) and then you just exposed it right away so and i'm not i don't hate on your whiteboard i hate on half of your whiteboard because it's just like a i don't even know where you get that thing that it's like just like a long the internet you okay. can get everything right. on the internet except right. a watch she uh, rented it watch she band. rented it <laughs> all right all right okay so you can check out both books um shift to student led and udl and blended learning and hey let's give a a little shout out to the visionary who brought you two together george caros good job <laughs> to both of you we said you two should get to know matchmaker each other. matchmaker make that's me right <laughs> you know this uh yeah because uh oh i didn't know you'd both turn on me but whatever, whatever. <laughs> a little because we want a little connection to the last one because i was really upset and i just want to make sure that we're doing some like godfather 2 to godfather 3 so there's a little connection between so you can watch the whole podcast as well too okay so the the next question i have for you is shift writing into the classroom so tell me what is different about this book and and it, from from the last two and 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 really what what is the main focus of this and what's the hope for what it actually achieves you want to kick it off or you want me to katie sure i mean i'll take it over here so i mean obviously we uh as a as a nation um the most neglected skill we have is writing um because our writing scores nationally are, are basically the lowest lower than our reading scores. And and so when we think about writing as a neglected skill, it can't be something that only English teachers are doing. It's really everybody needs to assign writing. And and in some cases we're assigning writing, but now with all of the advances in technology and artificial intelligence, if we're assigning writing and we're saying to kids, just go home and produce writing, then they're going to use these emerging technologies and they're going to spit out answers that they don't have any real ownership in creating. And certainly a lot of people utilize these tools, but to utilize these tools before you develop your own writing voice or understand the writing process is incredibly dangerous because you're allowing robots to speak on your behalf, essentially. And so what we're encouraging people to do is to actually bring writing into the classroom because writing is an expression of thinking. And we want students to think critically and we want them to communicate. And so how do we ensure that every single teacher is not only having students write to learn, things like exit tickets and and entrance tickets and and quick jotting, summarizing notes, but also learning how to write in every field because writing in math is different than writing a music critique is different than, you know, writing um, a workout plan in PE, but really authentic writing and not just saying go home and do it, but like let's brainstorm together. Here's a bunch of options for brainstorming. Let's do some pre-writing activities together. Let's plan what we want to say together. And once you go through that process and you're sitting side by side with students and you know what they're thinking and what they're planning, it would be very difficult for a student to just go home and produce something where you wouldn't say that isn't what we talked about yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is not your idea. Those are not your words. And so really helping students to do the heavy lift of 
this is what I want to say. This is what I want to produce. And then if they're utilizing those tools, they have the skills to metacognitively say, no, 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 that's not how I want to say it. And I think that the most important thing is that we don't lose our ability to think critically hmm. and just lean into these tools and be like, yeah, they want to be active enough. Like, let's just have them do it. What yeah. do you got? What do you got, Calvin? I totally agree. I think to your point about Godfather and the third movie sucking and the <laughs> challenge around this particular book is that I feel so many people will see shift writing and be like, oh, that's an English thing. And I think what Katie and I are trying mm. to focus on when we talk about this book is writing needs to happen in every subject area. And if you look at the research, research indicates that writing improves reading skills, right to learn activities in science, history, um, in math, they all improve learning, the quality of learning, student achievement in those, those subject areas, like reading comprehension, retention, all of these things are benefited when we have students write. But right now the, you know, I go into lots of classrooms, you don't see a lot of explicit writing instruction. The research says kids aren't getting a lot of that past third grade. They're being sent home with these writing prompts that they have zero kind of investment in, ownership, interest in. And of course, they're going to lean on AI or whatever makes it easier to kind of spit out an answer and move on. So we've literally broken down every part of the writing process, even starting with like, do you even know what good writing is? in this subject area for this type of task looks like. Like, let's take a look at the exemplars. Let's have conversations about what you're seeing and noticing and what would you, what would you say is cri the success criteria for this type of writing? And all of the things that we talk about in the book are positioned to eventually let students lead that part of the process as well. We want students to really feel confident engaging with each other and each part of the writing process. So for me, I think it's that messaging of like, we all share this responsibility and every single subject area can benefit from adding writing, but making it part of, you know, the class itself, not sending it home with students. Mm -hmm. And I think to Katie's point, you know, as you develop your voice, as you understand how to structure and approach different types of writing, I mean, I write all the time. And yes, I have thrown a paragraph into ChatGPT and been like, hey, is this cohesive? Should I develop mm -hmm. anything? Would you suggest any improvements? And sometimes it'll suggest things and I'm like, no, nah, I don't like that. I like the way I did it way better mm -hmm. because I understand what I'm trying to say. I know my voice. I know what I'm writing for in terms of the goal of this particular writing assignment. So I totally agree that that's really should be kind of the, the goal is helping students to develop that confidence as writers. And then they can use AI as a thought partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the one of the best analogies I heard for the use of like ChatGPT AI was like it's a second second brain, right? Like it's not, but some are using it as the brain, right? Yes, their brain. Exactly. And the you know I, I was thinking about this as as you're both sharing your insights that there's really two no better two models of living this book than both of you because I I guarantee you 100 percent you would not be known as the experts in your areas if you didn't actually undertake writing, like in your own process. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, Callan, like I know, I know Katie's written a ton of books and I actually met Katie face to face for the first time. Um, and, and then started reading a lot of her stuff. And then, but you, I actually, I read your blog all the time before I met you. And, right. and so like, I, you know, I remember just reading it and just, you know, just being so amazed with all the ideas that you have and both of you really write it. it Cause like you, you said something, Katie, and like the idea of we, there's a difference between, um, writing to share learning and writing to learn. And a lot of my writing mm -hmm. that I've done over the years, and I I've been asked this, like, what is the best social network that you've ever been a part of? Is it Twitter? Is it Instagram? Like what's the best thing? And I'm like, it's my blog 100% because actually going in and thinking deeply. And one of my favorite quotes ever, uh, is from, I think, I think his name is Clive Thompson and I'm paraphrasing. He said, you know, he talked about writing for an audience and he said, um, anyone like can put, like have a message in their head, but when you like write for an audience, you have to like truly clarify your thinking, like, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I'm always trying to think like, what is going to be the challenge to what I'm saying? Like what is going to be the pushback and really kind of going through that process of writing. And I actually, one of the things, and I'm curious about your thoughts on this as a principal, I used to actually embed time into our PD days 
for teachers to blog and write about stuff they're doing in their classroom and then actually come back. And this was not like, you have to do this on Monday and we're going to read it Friday. I would actually embed it into our professional learning days where they actually had to write and reflect. But then there is an accountability because we're all going to read each other's at 2.30. And, and they really appreciated that. And then we started talking about like dear time, drop everything and read and how important that is. But are kids actually creating content? Are they actually writing? So you model your reading when the kids are reading at this age level, but they don't ever see you write. Why wouldn't you, if you're reading a book when they're reading books, why don't you write while they're writing? So actually embedding that as part of your own learning process. And I'm like curious of your thoughts of like how educators could do this too, like how they could actually deepen their own learning and whatever their area of interest is in their own writing process. I don't know if you talk about that in the book or you have some ideas of things that you want to share with that. I mean, as, as far as, I mean, I, I work with adult learners all the time. And, you know, I think that, that having to go through the process of the writing process is what's valuable. And mm -hmm. using something like ChatGPT skips a lot of that process, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, certainly it can help at different levels, but I still always, always, always draft with no assistive technology. I don't like spell check. I don't like Grammarly in there because I don't want to get distracted by mistakes. I like like a total free write, mm -hmm. like a total brain dump, right? So generally if I'm going to do some, you know, pre-writing, I'll often, you know, uh, explore some resources, maybe look at some exemplars, try to clarify my thinking around what I want to say. Uh, I still like a good outline. Kat and I actually will outline. Yeah. We'll make a table of contents. We'll give each other feedback on that. And then I will always draft originally. So like, this is what I wanna say. I think like Kat, at that point, I might put something into AI and say, like, I feel like I need a transition between mm -hmm. these two paragraphs, is that clear? I love Grammarly, it will point out, I use a wow. lot of passive construction without realizing it and it will point that out for me. And I feel like going through that process of, it will help me with the, you know, revision, with the editing, but, I don't want it to do my thinking. I don't want it to do my, you know, or, and I don't want it to do my drafting. Um, and, and certainly I'm open to other people's opinions on other things, but I feel like that is where mm -hmm. the critical thinking, where like my style really goes in. And I've explored to see, can it replicate my style? And it can't, right. even if I share with it, like here's 10 blogs I've written. How would I write this? Right. It's almost laughable of like, no, I would like, I would never use the word furthermore, like back up. Oh um, yeah. So yeah. I think like, other than saying I further, voice, I would never use furthermore. <laughs> furthermore, I would never use the word furthermore. <laughs> so um, I think that teachers really need opportunities to brainstorm together with their brains, right? Mm -hmm. You always say, George, the smartest person in the room is the room, right? We can't like shift that thinking over to robots because there's just so much bias there's so much misinformation and we can't just think that it's, it's not accurate like it tells you when you log in like might be inaccurate and we're using these things like it's like it's a, a guarantee magic wand and it's not yeah, yeah. do you know you know actually so i i sort of i started when i was doing like book reviews right i started doing book reviews this last year and I have read more books in this last year than I probably have the last five, 10 years combined. I've just been really intentional about doing it, finding time to do it and really trying to kind of get my thinking out on these books. Like how does it push my thinking? And really when I do that, I don't, I'm not, I'm not big on like, I'm going to read 500 books this year or whatever. It's like, Hey, I'd rather read 10 books, write about them, share some ideas, go through that process. And one of the things that I've done is I'll like in the podcast, I'll actually say, Hey, here's a couple things that really kind of resonate with me, but here's a, here's a short summary as provided by ChatGPT. So I usually actually use it as a reference to like give a really succinct thing. And then I go back. So I actually, you know, like I, I kind of like go in and out, like, Hey, here's, here's me referencing it. Cause I think there is a, there is a time and place to actually utilize these things. But also this part of the podcast, this is explicitly me. And these are things that ChatGPT doesn't know about my thinking or stories that I have that relate to it. So I don't think it's about you don't use this stuff. You don't, you know, connect with it, but really, and it's really kind of helped me once I, I feel like once I write 
about those books or write about something like even I suggest this to people all the time. If you go to a conference, it's way better to like see a keynote or go to a session and then skip the next session and then write about the session you were just in. You'll actually, then it'll just become part of you. And that, that has really kind of helped me. It's something I've been doing uh, for years. This is the last question I'll ask you. Cause we, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, please. Absolutely. I want to just dovetail because I love what you're suggesting about like the the way in which you're kind of really intentionally using it mm. and making it clear how you're using it. Because one of the things I do want to say is in this book, it's structured like Katie and my previous books. We start with an anecdote. We've got research versus reality. And then we get into strategies. Mm. And we always have a collection of strategies because we know teachers are different. Different things are going to appeal to different people. Yeah. One of the There's one strategy in every single chapter that is an AI enhanced strategy. So if you as a teacher are using AI with your students, like that's okay under the umbrella of your school, your district, whatever, trying to help these humans understand how to use something Mm -hmm. that's not going away will only become more robust and integrated into our lives. Here are ideas for how you can leverage AI at different points in the writing process to really help students to have that thought partner, to get feedback. Um, So it's not a, hey, don't use it. It's here's all the ways, here's all these strategies you can use. And here's an AI enhanced strategy if you're interested. Well, even Katie, when you brought up Grammarly, like I started using that years ago. And then I I started doing these like revisits. I'm like, hey, I'm going to pull a post I wrote 10 years ago that before I started using Grammarly and then I like put Grammarly through it, I'm like, oh my God, right? And it's like, it's almost like a little bit of a video game for me. It's like when I press it and see how many errors I have, I'm like, oh my God. And so I like try to, it's actually weird. I try to improve to get as few errors every time I write something. Yes. And it like te- yes. it teaches you writing like a little bit too, right? Yep. It's not just like it's replaced. It totally does. Right. And, you know, I always kind of make the joke about spell check is like, oh, kids don't need to know how to like do spelling tests anymore because they got spell check. I'm like, well, you have to be kind of in the vicinity of the word. Like you can't just slap keys and all of a sudden. Right. But (laughs) but but it it actually teaches you a little bit if you use it as a teaching tool. And this this is the last question. And and Callan, I'll I'll actually turn this over to you because you kind of built on this, too. And your last response really connects with this. I read a lot of email newsletters. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm really interested in them too. And, and I, now I'm a little bit like, you didn't write this. Like AI wrote this. And mm-hmm. you're seeing, you're feeling that more and more. And sometimes like, I'm, I'm like, I feel better about this conversation personally because I always, like I'm struggling. I'm like, well, like I'm putting all this time and effort into actually writing my own content to actually mm-hmm. writing this. And I have been very intentional over the years not to like jump on trends and to write about what's what's now or whatever. I write about what matters to me at the moment because that's because I because then I am intentionally of I'm writing to improve myself, not writing for clicks, writing for, you know, to to get followers or anything like this. I'm just writing about what I'm passionate about. So you'll see sometimes I write about innovation. Sometimes I run about training for a marathon. Sometimes I run about like my health stuff that I'm struggling with. Sometimes I write about basketball, right? And I, I think like, cause I wanna write about what I wanna write about. And if you learn something along the way that's beneficial. And so when you're having this, like there, there there's this feeling I think with a lot of people and, and probably both of you feel this some way too, is that like, cause you I can put in, I've written enough blogs. I can say write in the style of George Kroos. And it can go through my stuff and kind of give me, I know you said like, it's not going to be exactly like I write, but it's going to be somewhat close. And I just have to tweak it here and there. So like, how, how do you get people or teachers, you know, educators to really kind of focus on really getting students to understand why this is so important to actually write when they can just, you know, we could just kids can just do it on their own, right? Like they don't see, they don't necessarily see the value of it because someone will do it. Some, someone else will do this for them. Yeah, but that's, that's the issue. I could explain and articulate backed by research, the why for any audience, students, teachers, whatever. And until you experience it, mm-hmm. until you've written something that is this kind of manifestation of your thought process or your ideas and you're like proud of what you've created, I don't think you're going to buy in. And so many students don't ever experience that because they don't get a lot of explicit instruction. 
on how to write in a classroom. They don't have much time to collaborate with peers and share ideas and like make meaning together and work on written products together. They're not getting regular feedback from teachers and they're being sent home with prompts they quite frankly don't mm -hmm. care about. And so if we want students to understand why this is valuable, because the reason you put in that hard work is because you know that by writing and struggling with your ideas, mm -hmm you're actually learning. You're going to be, when you stand up in front of a crowd of people and you talk about something, you've done the heavy cognitive lift of working your way through it and writing about it. And you know, that's valuable. Yeah. I just wrote an article for Edutopia and they're very explicit on their site. No mm -hmm. AI assist. So it was, you know, it's me going through. I didn't even ask chat GP, GPT hmm. a single question about the piece yeah. itself. But going through that mental wrestle of like, how do I explain this idea in my in my own words, there is something so gratifying about that end product. But what I think I'm concerned about is students don't have the support or the opportunity to go through that hard work in a space where Honestly, like that's what classrooms should be used for. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of equity issues when we send that kind of cognitive work home with kids. Mm -hmm. But if we create those spaces where they're supported, peers, technology, teachers, then we have more students who are going to be like, I feel the benefit of doing this work, whether I created the story or I really explain this in depth or I'm proud of my thinking around this, but they're not getting those opportunities. And that's why it's so important for writing to happen in classrooms. Katie, what do you got? I got something to share, but I'd love to hear from you too. Um, I, one of the stories I wanted to tell, just again, like it is a tool. People are going to use it. It's like, how do we use it responsibly without losing our human skills, our innovators mindset, right? You don't want to shift that. And so we were, boom, boom, boom. So we were playing around, Kat and I, right? And um, we were talking about this before we went on air here about uh, a little mishap I had where I um, traveled to a presentation and I was about to give a keynote and I was getting ready in the morning and it was just a one day. So I had like a backpack and I was like, oh, here's my cute sweater that I rented. And, you know, <laughs> here's my cute heels and like, oopsie, where are the pants that I rented? And they never made it. So I had like the sweatpants I wore on the plane and didn't have anything else. Right. And at this point, like, I have to think critically. Right. So, you know, I'm there in the morning and I was like, oh my gosh. So I was like, okay, Katie. Like, you got this, right? Like, what are my options? See if somebody left something in the hotel, you know, um, lost and found. Maybe I could see if there was like a store open at 5 a.m. Like, is there a 24-hour place that sells pants? You know, I could write to like the school administrator and be like, how tall are you? Are you at least 5'8"? Um, <laughs> and so, right, I have all these plans and I'm like, all right. So like, I did my brainstorm, right? That's like the pre-writing, right? So I like go down to the hotel. I'm like, hey, anything in the lost and found? Any like waitresses that work here? Do you have uniforms? And I'm like, no. Turns out there was a 24 hour Walmart. And so I, you know, took an Uber to the Walmart, showed up, right? I mean, the pants there, I'm telling you, they were like 12 bucks and they were awesome. So um, the whole thing, I solved the problem, right? And it's like, I kind of was like laughing my way through it being like, I will figure this out. Right. So it's like the reflection, it's the problem solving, it's the critical thinking. Right. So we were joking about it. We told a little anecdote about it. And so just out of curiosity, we're like, imagine if we didn't have the ability to think critically and we just became to rely only on chat GPT. And so I put it in and I was like, I am at a hotel. It is five o'clock in the morning. I have to do a big presentation. What should I do? And I kid you not, if I was dependent on this to do thinking right. for me, it told me to go to the presentation in the hotel robe, in the robe. And I was like, can you imagine like if I, and it's such a perfect example of like, what can happen? Like if I didn't practice Right. you know, critically thinking. And I was just like, okay, okay. Like, I mean, that would have been my last presentation right there, right? If I go rolling in. <laughs> or your first in a, with a very different it. audience. I would like to be clear, um, if anybody listening, the fact that yeah. these pants did not make it into Katie's backpack was not the fault that, of Rent mm -hmm. the Runway. I was going to say. A, uh, it was a, a oh, no, no, oh, no, no, oh no. Rent the Runway. As our sponsor. Oh no. Sponsored by Rent the Runway. Them. I, I 
them. They just didn't make the cut. Um, and so turns out, but like, if you think about that on a large scale, like if that's an allegory for what could go wrong, it's like, if we <laughs> don't is. witness and scaffold these critical thinking skills in front of us, we are going to have a group of people who only rely on the robots to make decisions. And like, that is not the most responsible decision, you know, in the old education space. Right. Yeah, no, probably not. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, the stories you have are just fascinating. <laughs> I will say that just like where that went. And so, you know, Hey, Callie, when you're saying there is a teacher I worked with, her name is Kelly Holden and she's just, um, was an is an amazing teacher. And I actually remember when I worked at central office, she invited me to her classroom and she did exactly what you're talking about. They had blogging parties. So like all the kids would be on there and they'd be like talking about what they were writing about. And she'd be writing in her blog. And you know, I went, I went there, I was writing in my blog, central office. Uh, it, it was just like a really amazing opportunity to like have kids kind of like brainstorm brain, right, go through that process and do it and just kind of see the excitement of that too. And, Kind of building on um, what you said, Katie, the the thing that um, we talked about right before we got on the podcast that I'm allowed to talk about is the, is I actually have been arguing this for a long time. Kids are not better at technology than we were when we were kids. The technology is so much easier that it almost can dumb you down, right? So in the analogy I always give, is if you really think about the, if you had your iPhone, right? Your first iPhone ever, what did the instruction manual tell you? And people like kind of say, well, I think it said this. And, said, and I say, well, actually, no, it didn't because you didn't have an instruction manual. There is no instruction manual that ever came with iPhones. And that was the intention is that they made it so easy that anybody could pick it up and just start using it. But when I got an Apple IIc when I was a kid, it was the greatest thing ever. But to actually, I had to know programming. I didn't know certain things to make it do anything. And so the more we kind of like focus on, well, you can use this, you can use this, the less we actually think. And you're seeing like a lot of, you know, going back to stoicism and like ancient thinking, you're seeing this because they're saying like, you know, thinking is actually a really important process. Writing is a really important process. And so I think that is uh, something that technology, when we say, oh, these kids are so much better, they might, the technology might be easier, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily smarter because we can kind of lend into that, right? And, and, and so that's something that I'm really excited about this. I will tell you that I, I've said this forever. Writing has been the best learning for me ever. So I'm like really excited about this book because this is like such a powerful thing. So um, Rent a Runway, thanks for sponsoring the podcast. <laughs> So, them this episode. Just so you I'm know, I, I wrote it. in Innovate Inside the Box that, you know, my goal is to become an Instagram model one day. So rent a runway. Just saying, if you're out there. Runway. They don't right? have, they don't have men's clothing yet, but like you could be the, like you oh, could man. be the influencer that there you makes go. it happen. I, I'll give you the first one. Yeah. There you go. We're sending oh. this to them. We, Kat and I need a free month. <laughs> there you go. So check it out. It is available. Uh, we recorded this podcast right uh, before the new year, but you are listening to it. The book is available now, uh, shift writing into the classroom with UDL and blended learning. And I, I'm going to give you a heads up. I think they're making a Godfather four. So mm -hmm. you got to get your fourth book out before the Godfather four. So, and then, <laughs> and then the Godfather movies will be referring to you. That is the goal. That is it. Ooh, shoot that's big yeah. i love it all right thanks everyone for listening is that katie from rent the runway <laughs> <laughs> thanks rent the runway for sponsoring today's podcast <laughs> and i hope you all have a wonderful day take care